Uh, my name is Irene Sun Wu. I'm the GSAP Director of Exhibitions, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this event, uh, Encounters with Arakawa and Madeline Ginz, uh, a half-day conference organized on the occasion of the exhibition Arakawa and Madeline Ginn's Eternal Gradient, which is currently on view in the Arthur Ross Architecture Gallery, uh, just two doors down. Uh, and we'll have a, a short coffee break uh, after the second panel, so you'll have an opportunity to hop over there if you haven't seen the show yet. Um, I wanted to thank, uh, first of all, Dina Malandros, who couldn't be with us uh, this afternoon, uh, but she was incredibly supportive of this project from the very beginning. Uh, and I also especially wanted to thank her for being very uh, game in terms of trying new things in Ross. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to develop this project in conversation with her. I also wanted to express huge thanks to the estate of Madeline Ginz and the Reversible Destiny Foundation, especially Peter Katz and Stephen Hepworth, who have been incredibly generous with their time and resources and have been really integral to the curatorial advancement of this project. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge Tiffany Lambert, uh, the Assistant Director of Exhibitions, who was my co-curator on the project and helped see it through uh, all the way to the end. And we were really fortunate to be able to work with Norman Kelly, Carrie Norman, and Thomas Kelly, uh, who's unable to join us today. Um, but they produced an incredibly intelligent and stunning exhibition design, uh, which is really going to knock your socks off if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, Aline Mule uh, was our graphic designer and produced a really uh, beautiful and thoughtful uh, approach to quite challenging and complex content. Uh, so I'd like to thank her for all of her hard work. Uh, and of course, to the events and communications team, Lila, Stefan, uh, Paul, and Shannon. Uh, and also, of course, uh, very big thanks to all of our presenters, some of whom have flown in from Hong Kong just for a day, from Tokyo, from London, uh, and from Berlin. So it, it's really wonderful to have uh, this, this group of people able to join us today to, to speak about Arakawa and Madeline in quite different ways. Um, if I could have the next slide, Rosanna. And even further up than that, one more. Oh, sorry, I can do this. Never mind. Right, so in fact, I was not familiar with the work of Arakawa and Madeline until I happened to go to a documentary on their work called The Children Who Won't Die. Uh, this was screened at Triple Canopy uh, in November 2016. I had to go back through some of my emails to figure out when this actually happened. Um, and the, this documentary was made in 2010 uh, and is an exploration of Arakawa and Madeline's architectural work. Uh, and I was really blown away by all of this incredibly imaginative and creative and daring architectural material and theory, uh, which I had never encountered in my architectural history education or even uh, having been through multiple architecture schools in North America and in Europe. Uh, so I was really drawn, uh, you know, I'm a historian uh, first and foremost, so I was very curious about finding more about their history, their backgrounds, et cetera. And this movie also brought to light this uh, very provocative philosophy that they were putting forward, which they termed reversible destiny. Uh, so um, a quite complex concept that will unpack throughout the day from different perspectives. Uh, but in broad strokes, this is a claim that uh, through a more rigorous and integrated and dynamic relationship between the body and our architectural surroundings, uh, human perception and consciousness could be fully stimulated and activated, and in turn leading to a more active rather than passive experience within the world. So rather than a notion of uh, achieving eternal life, uh, we might be able to approach this concept of reversible destiny more as a reclamation of one's own life. So having full control of one's being and thus understanding one's place within the world and uh, implicitly with other people. 
Now, in starting the research, the most accessible projects to consider were a group of built works. Um, uh, there's about four or five total. Uh, and the, the movie, uh, Children Who Won't Die, focused especially on the Mitaka lofts in Tokyo uh, from 2005. Uh, and we're, we're really fortunate to have Momoyo Hama, who was involved in the project, to speak about this project as well as others that were realized in Japan. Uh, including Yoro Park in Gifu, uh, Japan from 1995, and also a uh, ubiquitous site, an installation at a, a really quite exquisite Isosaki Museum in Nagi. And I'm just cycling through these quickly because I know that Momoyo will speak about them in more detail. Uh, more local is the Bioscleave House uh, in East Hampton, Long Island from 2008, and perhaps some of you have even visited uh, the house, um, and I know that a few of our presenters will be able to speak about it from firsthand experience. Now, to start the research on the project, I reached out to uh, the estate of Madeline Ginz, which is the keeper of the archive for the artists. Um, and it was quite um, challenging and interesting to go through this material, which um, was in a kind of nascent state in, in terms of its archival organization. It's been kind of freshly plucked uh, from their home and studio at 100 and uh, 124 West Houston Street, uh, and was really, or is really jam-packed with uh, an overwhelming amount of material. So this was an incredibly re uh, rich, but challenging research project. So considering their architectural context, another important point of entry was a 1997 exhibition at the Guggenheim Soho, uh, which they, co-organized with the curator, Michael Govan. Uh, and here you see some install shots. So it's quite rich with models. Uh, you can, oops, sorry. You can see that they've expanded some of their designs, um, you know, from an individual home now to an urban scale, uh, which you see in the slide on the right. Uh, and also uh, an incredible amount of models were on display as well. Uh, but this is also kind of a, um, typical architectural exhibition with panels and models uh, displayed in the gallery. Uh, and here are just some renderings to, to point out that at this time they were really embracing digital technology, which was allowing them to envision some of their proposals at a much, much larger scale. So at the urban uh, and also in terms of looking at individual architectural units, uh, working out more complex details that uh, might otherwise not have been possible on the page. But in doing the research at the archive, um, one was also confronted with the fact that Arakawa and Madeline also had their, their own careers before they jumped directly into architecture. So during the 60s and 70s and 80s, Arakawa had a quite successful and prolific career as a painter. Uh, and so this was a whole other realm of research uh, that was um, there to be considered in terms of archival material that was surfacing in boxes and folders, uh, but also Madeline's uh, own career as a poet, writer, and philosopher. So on the right, you see one of her poems that was uh, taken out of a box. So in sum, we have a painter, a poet, architects, writers. I mean, there's a, <laughs> an overwhelming amount of work to deal with. And for this reason, I'm really pleased that we have such a range of speakers today who will be able to provide different perspectives and lend their own expertise. Uh, because I really do think it takes a team of people uh, to really work through a lot of this material. Um, this is an image of Wovo's art storage, which uh, Stephen Hepworth, our, um, our, uh, our champion uh, at the foundation, was able to coordinate for our viewing. Um, he was also really important in pointing out that there was this trove of architectural drawings, hand drawings, that hadn't been looked at, hadn't been exhibited, uh, and hadn't been written about at all. Um, so at a certain point in the curatorial research, it was decided, you know, this, this could be the way to, to focus this show, which otherwise would have to draw upon all of these di different disciplines and types of materials. Um, 
so this was the day at the candy shop, as Stephen put it, when we went to sift through uh, all of these gorgeous materials, many of them really, really huge. It's kind of hard to tell from this photo, but some of the drawings are you know, about eight feet long. And so drawings became the framework for the exhibition. Um, so I'm just going to walk you quickly through the organizational structure for the show before I turn it over to some of our presenters, but we'll also be able to kind of dive back into some of this material, these architectural drawings in a, in a panel um, with uh, the curators and the exhibition designer. Uh, so one important project that's featured in the show is called the Container for Mind Blank Body. Uh, this, we discovered, was Arakawa and Madeline's first architectural project, dating from about 1983 to 84. Uh, it's a bit of a mystery in terms of its history, but from what I can tell, uh, based on archival materials, they were invited to develop a proposal for an island in the Venetian Lagoon. Uh, interestingly, the invitation came from Paolo Cacciari, who was then the uh, deputy mayor of Venice and also brother of architectural theorist Massimo Cacciari. Uh, and we know that Arakawa and Madeline went to Venice. We have some photos of their visit uh, in the exhibition, very charming romantic photos of them in the, the hazy mist of Venice. Uh, and this, as you can tell from this drawing, is an incredibly monumental uh, proposal. There is one little body sneaking in here. Uh, and they've uh, laid this project out as a series of gigantic units uh, within which uh, the users would encounter different obstacles and materials, lighting, projections, etc., that were intended to kind of overstimulate uh, the bodily, uh, bodily perception uh, and experience walking through the space. We also found some really beautiful uh, uh, little drawings to uh, to explain what's happening here. There's a kind of labyrinth that goes around the entire structure, uh, and they've described these as trench drawings, so these kind of tunnels uh, around the perimeter. And this element is something that actually reappears in Yoro Park in 95. So a lot of the elements from this project um, are, are the beginnings of their thinking about different architectural fragments and strategies that are going to really inform a lot of their work in the following decade. And I should say, in terms of chronology, the show is really focusing on this period of the 80s, so from about roughly 83 until 91. Uh, another real find, um, thanks to Stephen, uh, was this group of 24 drawings called screen valves, uh, also quite a mystery, nothing written about them as far as we can tell, haven't been exhibited. Um, a little sticker on a photo that we found gave us a clue to the date uh, and the title of these objects. Um, but seen uh, as a whole, they really read as a kind of uh, spatial experiment that is being performed over and over again in this uh, repeated module that's being jammed with different objects the spaces are being divided up, uh, and sometimes, uh, quite explicitly, we see these architectural interiors emerging. And this also became a clue in terms of other drawings that we found where you know, I began to understand that this was actually a module that was being repeated elsewhere. So they're really thinking about expanding uh, individual elements that are being fine-tuned and poured over uh, in the studio. Right, so these drawings that I'm showing you also lead up to one of their major projects uh, called The Bridge of Reversible Destiny, um, dating from about 87 to 1990. Uh, and this was really a continuation of the, the Venice Project container for Mind Blank Body that I just showed you. Uh, you know, expanding on this idea of individual containers lined up in a sequence and becoming much more complex in this design. And this project, as well as the Venice project, have really beautiful texts that have been written, uh, I would say, by Madeline, uh, which give 
quite evocative descriptions of what the mind and body is experiencing as it progresses through this space. And from this, we know that they envisioned bodies actually walking through walls and the walls reassembling behind them. So uh, a real literal uh, relationship between the body and architecture. Um, this was a very important project that was actually realized at the scale of a model, even though it was not realized on its intended site in France, uh, in a city called Epinal. Uh, it was meant to extend over a river. But they did produce a 42-foot model that was exhibited at Ronald Feldman's gallery in 1990. So it was quite important for them to actually put this out in the public uh, and make sure that it was disseminated. Uh, and also interesting here in looking at this project was a kind of discovery of the really intense model making culture that was at the heart of the studio. Uh, so in the exhibition we have uh, quite a number of model photographs. These are quite candid ones, uh, but there's also very staged photographs. So they were you know, very intense on capturing the, the model making uh, aspect of the project, and this was a, uh, an important way of putting it forward, uh, and the models would be, you know, overflowing in the studios by the 90s, uh, as some uh, of our presenters can attest to since they were part of that studio culture. So in the final two uh, sections, uh, the first one is looking at the body. Uh, they were doing um, some interesting image research uh, in terms of how to uh, articulate the body's tactile functions, uh, how to map out perception uh, and the relationship between the interior and exterior of the body to the interiors of architectural spaces. Uh, so based on some archival fi findings, we, we have some displays of some of these research materials. So on the left, uh, a selection of images borrowed and never returned uh, from the New York Public Library uh, under the category blind, right? So how do you visually articulate blindness and that experience? And then on the right, these really uh, psychedelic uh, illustrations uh, from a book called Man and Structure by the medical philosopher Fritz Kahn from the 1940s, so quite surreal. And these, we, we can see real correlations between these uh, visual strategies and some of the more diagrammatic drawings that they're producing by the late 80s and early 1990s. So in the gallery, we have this large-scale uh, drawing. Uh, it's a sketch. Uh, interestingly, for a computer drawing that they would produce immediately after. And you'll see when you go in the gallery, this is quite large in scale. So uh, again, it, it's kind of integrating Arakawa's painting practice in terms of uh, working with a large canvas, even though this is an architectural drawing. Uh, but then we also have the introduction of text at the bottom, which I think we can safely attribute to, to Madeline. Uh, at least her uh, literary contribution is really apparent there. Uh, and then lastly, we wanted to kind of recognize each of their uh, own independent creative practices. Uh, so there's a selection of items that, um, you know, obviously we can't uh, given a comprehensive overview of Arakawa's painting, uh, nor of all of the writing that Madeline did, but we made a selection of items that would tease out some resonances uh, and shared intellectual interests between them. Uh, and we have a, a panel uh, at the beginning of the conference to, to focus uh, on Arakawa's work and, and its reception in Japan, well, Madeline and Arakawa's reception in Japan through built work, uh, but we're also giving a panel uh, dedicated to Madeline's own writing, so uh, giving some room to breathe and really unpack both of their practices and consider how these work together. Right, so with that, um, I'd like to just start by introducing our first panel. Um, as I just mentioned, we'll be looking at Arakawa's work, particularly his early work from the 60s and 70s, I believe. Uh, and our presenter is Miwaka, Miwako Tatsuka, uh, who is a consulting curator at the Riverswell Destiny Foundation and has courageously flown in from Hong Kong uh, for the day just to participate, so we're incredibly pleased to have her here. And she'll be followed by Momoyo Hama, uh, who's director of Coordinologist Inc., but also director of Arakawa and Gin's Tokyo office, 
uh, and was very integral in the realization of their Mitaka Lofts project. Uh, and afterwards, we'll have a response by Julian Rose to wrap it up. So, Mawako? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this uh, conference. Uh, this is such a great opportunity, not only to introduce Arakawa and Madeline, but also for me personally to learn um, about their works from different perspectives. As uh, Irene kindly introduced me, I am actually, I'm trained as an art, art historian, so I come from that perspective into, uh, first of all, um, Arakawa's works from um, the context of post-war Japanese art and uh, how it relates to the broader international um, art movements uh, of the uh, 60s and onwards. So um, just uh, to start my uh, involvement with Arakawa and Gaines, um, I, uh, when I first met Arakawa and Madeline, I was still a graduate student right here at Columbia University, uh, spending far too much hours at Avery Library. And at that time, I was contemplating on writing my dissertation focusing on the topic of Duchamp's influence on Japanese artists of post-war period. So I had three artists in mind. Uh, one was Ayo, who was in New York uh, during 60s, 70s. Um, and then uh, Shigeko Kubota, who is another Japanese artist, woman artist, who was, um, uh, the, who it was the widow of Namjoon Paik. And the last, uh, but not least, the important artist was Arakawa. So I was looking into the general uh, information about this artist, and Arakawa was, you know, in the background of my mind. I didn't end up doing my dissertation, but um, as <laughs> as the fate brought me to him and Madeline, I was just wandering around in Soho one day. This was back in like 2002 or three. And I just ran into them in front of now um, uh, closed a uh, homuran soba noodle shop. And I was with a professor from uh, Tama Art University then. And we started to chat on the street. And five minutes turned into 10 minutes. And 10 minutes turned into 30 minutes. And because we were already in Soho, they invited us to their uh, studio then on uh, West Houston Street. So um, I had this amazing memory of speaking with them together um, on that happen chance uh, occasion. And we ended up that day spending like 10 hours together. So that was how I came into um, kind of glimpse. Uh, I, I had the glimpse into their world. And the thing I remembered most from that encounter was that uh, uh, like Irene described the uh, archival materials, they were just two container full of jam-packed information. And the conversation went from everything from art to philosophy to medicine to uh, whatnot, like things that I didn't even comprehend. So it was like a dream-like uh, um, experience. And I think um, when I think about Arakawa Madeline, and particularly Arakawa, a lot of people have this kind of image of mysterious person. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to start my um, slide with this uh, page uh, of a poem by uh, Madeline Gaines entitled, For Someone Who Calls Himself Arakawa. So there's always this kind of mystique surrounding Arakawa. And uh, if you just kind of skim through this text, um, it's just a beautiful poem trying to sort of locate this person who calls himself Arakawa in somewhere in this spectrum of the world. And essentially, when I look at uh, their works and Arakawa's paintings as well, um, that's what they had been doing. They're trying to um, decipher the uh, location of human existence and try to examine what uh, is true and not true about various aspects of human conditions, one of which is this um, 
to their, uh, in their opinion, mistaken concept of the uh, uh, unavoidable death. So um, before I go into uh, Arakawa's uh, biographical information, I just wanted to kind of bring out the voice of not only uh, uh, Arakawa, but also Madeline, because my presentation will most fo mostly focus on Arakawa's work. So I mentioned there is always this kind of surrounding mystique around Arakawa, and uh, um, this uh, is a front cover of uh, magazine Art News from May 1980 issue. And perhaps he, he could be one of the first Japanese contemporary artists to glaze the front cover of this major art magazine. I think the second one is like Mariko Mori, but we had to wait until 1990s. So he was a very successful artist at the time, and you know he, uh, he had this uh, feature article in this magazine uh, by Paul Gartner, and the way uh, he, Arakawa is described in this uh, profile uh, is that uh, the, re, uh, the writer uh, recalls this uh, moment in um, gathering, like a salon style gathering that uh, Arakawa and Madeline often hosted at their place for cre various creative people from different fields. And uh, uh, the writer recalls Arakawa saying that, quote, a cockroach knows how to use a house better than we do. And that one sentence when Arakawa pronounced uh, shut everybody else and the room was quiet and then on uh, they would have some interesting discussions. So that kind of meeting of uh, artistic minds were happening in Soho in 1980s. And he was really right in the middle of that um, creative um, energy of the, uh, the city at that moment. Um, but he was already quite a controversial artist when I uh, was in Japan. So before he moved to New York in 1961, he was a part of a group of neo-Dada um, uh, artists of post-war Japanese art world. Um, he was born in 1936 in Nagoya, which is you know hundreds of miles uh, west of Tokyo. But he uh, moved to Tokyo in uh, in 50s to become part of that uh, sort of post-war avant-garde movement and uh, uh, psychedelic culture of Japan. Um, I have two images here on the screen. Uh, one, the larger one on top, is a group of artists from Neo Dadaism organizers, uh, which was a short lived uh, avant garde artist group uh, based in Tokyo, uh, active just within a year of 1960. And Arakawa uh, was one of a key uh, founding artists of this group, along with other artists such as. Shinohara Ushio, who is also in New York now, um, Yoshimura Masunobu, uh, Toyoshima, uh, Toyoshima Soroku, uh, Kazakura Sho, uh, Ueno, uh, Ueno Norizo. And they were, um, some of them were trained as painters, but some others were uh, much more engaged in kind of happening events and uh, um, kind of street performance uh, type of uh, artistic expression at the time. And in this picture, they were strolling along the street of Ginza in 1960s, uh, really becoming a kind of you know, uh, attention uh, of a uh, lot of uh, passers-by of this central part of Tokyo City. Um, so they were uh, kind of young artists who were gathering uh, quite often uh, in uh, one of the artist studio located right in the center of Shinjuku. Uh, and you can see at the bottom here, um, group photo again. Uh, they would do uh, periodical gathering. Uh, oftentimes it would start with serious artistic discussions, but then uh, moves into this late night uh, drink and performance kind of gathering in the end. So Arakawa was part of that energetic group. 
And the type of works that he was creating at the time uh, was really kind of in line with uh, many other artists who were utilizing uh, many unconventional materials to create paintings, uh, relief sculptures, and in, in essence, like a lot of assemblages uh, were created during this time. Uh, partly because uh, not all of these artists were able to afford purchasing conventional canvases and oil paints. So they were trying to kind of scavenge hunt in the city to uh, obtain any kind of materials that would suit uh, their uh, desire to express something. So here is one example of uh, Arakawa's sculptural work called uh, Part One from 1960. kind of sliding towards me anyway. Is that better? No? <laughs> Is that better? Okay, good. I'll try to keep this distance. Uh, so uh, this is a sculptural work called Part 1, 1960, and it was exhibited at the 1960 uh, Yomiuri Andepandan Exhibition in Tokyo. And Andepandan Exhibition was a um, non-juried annual exhibition for uh, anybody who wanted to submit works. Um, and it was really serious um, exhibition, well, serious, like very experimental open exhibition that took place at Tokyo Metropolitan Museum. Um, and it, it was the uh, platform for emerging artists of the 60, uh, 50s and 60s Japan to uh, try out their um, uh, expressions. Um, so Arakawa uh, was showing at this annual exhibition at least three times, and some of the works were recorded. Uh, this is one image that I could find, and you can see how he's using um, uh, what seems to be a kind of concrete, like a massive concrete in the middle uh, with uh, attached uh, uh, like a garage like fabric on the uh, background. And uh, this is the kind of uh, experimental objects he was creating in, uh, in, within the kind of uh, uh, atmosphere of usage uh, of, or the method, method of using uh, junk materials. But it was a big jump for him to get there. Um, when he was still in uh, high school, back in his hometown in Nagoya, um, this is the type of work he was uh, practicing. Uh, he wasn't yet uh, an artist uh, per se. Uh, he was still a, a high school student, but you know he did uh, paint in this kind of traditional figurative style painting. Uh, when he was growing up, uh, he uh, had. The, he had a neighbor who was a doctor and had a clinic uh, operating from home. And because uh, the doctor lived very close by, Arakawa became quite close to him. And it so happens that uh, the doctor's wife, who was a painter, uh, uh, a painter who uh, encouraged Arakawa at the time about eight to 10 years old to uh, try out on painting. Um, apparently, uh, at that time, Arakawa was interested in becoming a doctor, and the doctor, along with uh, his wife, and, uh, told him that if you want to be a serious doctor, you have to be able to do anatomical drawing. So that was the kind of motivation um, Arakawa acquired while he was growing up. And he showed such a talent to the wife of the doctor that she convinced him to go to an art school. So that's, you know, as, according to Arakawa's own narrative, that's how he entered uh, Musashi no Art University in Tokyo later on. But it so turns out, once he entered this academic institution and started to take some courses, it was really too too conventional, too traditional, too confining to the traditional mode of expression. So he says that he dropped out within a few weeks of uh, a beginning of the school education. And he went out to do his own things. Uh, and one of the uh, key series that he started on his 
own you know, um, inspiration uh, was this series now called a coffin series. So as you can see one example here, um, it was this kind of object, um, you know, undescribable mass of uh, things encased within a wooden box aligned with satin, uh, you know, a field satin, which uh, is in the scale of like a human body. So it has this kind of eerie, um, uh, very like a few month scale presence when it is exhibited. Uh, and apparently, uh, this when this was exhibited in a gallery in 19, early 1961, uh, they were all uh, closed with uh, lids. So as visitors go to the gallery, they would have to open the uh, lids and then encounter this indescribable mass inside. So um, he, Arakawa was creating objects and as artwork, but he was also creating this uh, occasion for people to uh, interact with the, uh, with the objects. Uh, so it wasn't just the presentation of still uh, image or thing. Uh, it was uh, engaging people to interact with his work. So that interaction, the part of the interaction, I believe, is a very important part in Arakawa's work, and uh, it connects to his later works. And as I mentioned already, he moved to New York in 1961, and uh, uh, narrative goes that uh, well, he was part of this group, Neo-Dadaism uh, organizers, in 1960, but because his uh, solo exhibition in 1961 was so successful, successful that his success really disturbed the group mentality of the Dada, Dada group, uh, which is kind of you know working against this like experimental avant-garde spirit of the time. But that was Japanese uh, society, so Arakawa decided to really just get out of Japan, do something completely outside the box, and he decided to move to New York. And uh, part of the reason why he chose New York was because he was also fascinated about Marcel Duchamp's work. And um, with the introduction by Japanese art critic and poet Shuzo Takiguchi, Arakawa got in touch with Marcel Duchamp. So even before he physically moved to New York, he was starting communication with Duchamp. And once he got to New York, um, really as he landed, he called Marcel Duchamp, and apparently uh, Duchamp agreed to meet him in Washington Square Park. So there comes this like historical meeting of avant-garde from Japan and you know, uh, granddaddy of uh, neo Dadaism and neo Dada in New York of Marcel Duchamp. So in his early works, uh, particularly works from 1960s, um, you can kind of trace in, um, Arakawa's interest in particularly in surrealism and Dadaism where he um, you know, continues his uh, method of uh, assemblage, uh, creating encounter of unexpected objects such as an umbrella and a uh, 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 funnel and juxtaposed with uh, serial images uh, taken from Moybridge experiment photography capturing movement. So um, this kind of um, imagery uh, um, appeared oftentimes in his early uh, 60s works. But something started to happen even further, um, transformation of Arakawa as he uh, become more integral to the New York avant-garde scene now. Uh, in uh, mid to late 1960s, he started to use, uh, he started to incorporate language into his paintings. And he was using stencils like this one. These are some stencils that um, uh, were kept by uh, one of his studio assistants. Uh, and works such as this, the diagrammatic painting starts in uh, mid to late uh, 60s. So here uh, you still see a little bit, little bit of uh, trace uh, uh, residue of a surrealistic kind of um, sensual uh, aspect of composition, but at the same time you start to see the space, in this case interior space of uh, apartment room, um, starts to be um, uh, become 
uh, combination of different signs. So rather than yeah, r rather than keeping the um, uh, illusionistic uh, depiction and representation of, of painting, he is starting to avoid all that, get rid of all that conventional method of representation and move into these diagrammatic uh, composition uh, in his uh, late 60s work. And that continues onward on 1970s. And I'm just showing you some one or two examples. And I wanted to show you these works because um, as um, Stephen uh, and I went through many uh, canvas uh, left from 60s and uh, 70s uh, in the estate, we realized how even though on the first glance, Arakawa's paintings are very kind of you know, very minimalistic and um, monotonous sometimes, uh, and then uh, very like uh, uh, kind of difficult to um, grasp in terms of uh, visual uh, presentation. When you see the texture of canvases, uh, see them as material objects, they're such beautiful, they have such a beautiful presence. Uh, the uh, beautiful handling of, of color, um, these drips of colors are really intentionally placed there. So um, as paintings, they are quite an amazingly uh, uh, impressive works. And he continues uh, into 80s, uh, keep, uh, keeping his interest in yeah, uh, usage of uh, diagrammatic signs, such as arrows, uh, and also alphabets, uh, in this case, arranged in the eye chart format. And uh, his uh, paintings also started to become larger and larger, um, in a sense, starting to become, uh, starting to kind of embrace these, uh, archi I kind of, I, I got the, <laughs> it's time. Um, uh, it, so his work started to embrace the architectural space. So he was already thinking about how to uh, engage uh, viewers, not only through their visual uh, perception of the works, but the physical reaction to the images that he create on canvas. So in, particularly in this canvas, I think it sh shows you that uh, from the left side panel, where you see grids of different colors, um, these grids are essentially uh, dissected light. It's a different, uh, you know, um, segments of light spectrum, and this is how eyes see the world. And you realize that on the next panel because it is really like measuring how your eyes uh, look. Um, the world, and then move on further towards the right-hand side, and you start to see less and less. And on the third, from the left panel, you face the blank, and the concept of blank, as I, I'm sure we will talk about this more in the uh, in rest of the day today, uh, is a very important uh, concept that uh, comes back into the architectural projects. And from that blank, what interests me most is this uh, importance of physical movement. The movement itself is how we perceive or we uh, start to perceive the world. It's not just the vision. I think uh, what essentially, particularly this composition tells us is that um, eyes can uh, encounter the world through uh, color, but bodies do not see color. So that's uh, actually Leotard saying, but I think um, Arakawa is trying to, in this case, in painting, painterly composition, say that physical um, uh, movement is the way we uh, conceive and perceive the world. Um, so that kind of um, um, importance placed on the physical existence, uh, I'm just going to skip through uh, to the last image I'm going to show you, um, goes into the uh, essential basis for Arakawa Nigin's architectural projects where physical interaction uh, to their design of space becomes primary 
uh, importance. And uh, this uh, park, Yoro Park in Gifu, is something truly amazing when you actually enter there. And within the matter of spending 10, 15 minutes in this park, it really starts to uh, change how your body engages with the space and also time. So uh, once you step outside from, from this park, you almost feel it's kind of strange to be standing on the flat ground. So within the matter of one hour, that's how his, uh, their design of your park changes uh, your physical interaction with the world. So with that, I know this was really kind of superficial, general, quick run through of progression of Arakawa and Madeleine's work. Um, in my presentation, but I hope uh, these images uh, kind of um, linger on in the rest of the uh, presentation and we can bring some of the issues that come up into our discussion. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Momoya Homa, uh, the head of Arakawa and Gin's Tokyo office. Uh, <coughs> This is uh, where my office locates in. It's a reversible destiny loft mitaka uh, in memory of Helen Keller. Um, uh, obviously designed by Arakawa and Gins. Um, I started working with Arakawa and Madeline since around 2000. And although I'm not an architect, I worked uh, with them together in various projects and accompanied them in their later years. So um, I would like to introduce uh, built works of Arakan and Gins today uh, in historical order. Uh, but first of all, I have to say that it is almost impossible to explain their works in words. So I know this attempt is quite paradoxical, but uh, I will try my best anyway. Hi, Arakawa and Madeline. Um, Arakawa and Gin started focusing on architecture in the 1980s. Um, in the exhibition opens today, uh, we can see their beautiful drawings and architecture model and some other uh, related archival materials from the 80s and early 90s, <laughs> early 90s. Uh, but when Arakawa announced uh, that he would quit painting and started working in architecture, many people, uh, especially museum curators, uh, art critics, and gallerists uh, were so confused because uh, at that time he was already an internationally acclaimed artist. But I believe that for Arakawa and Madeline's uh, creative trajectory, the job title didn't mean so much. Uh, they just found that uh, there were so many frames and limits if they continued working as artists. For example, even if they would appeal, if they uh, would like to uh, appeal something through their artworks, um, it would only reach people who could come and see them at museums or galleries. In contrast, they found a huge possibility in architecture uh, because the architecture always associates directly with the social world. So they saw uh, a huge possibility in architecture, perhaps uh, even more so than practicing architects. That is when they started calling themselves as architects. They also referred to themselves as coordinologists. Coordinologist means uh, the expert in coordinating art, philosophy, and science, a, a word created by Araka and Madeline. Um, well, I will now show you a couple of works by Araka and Gins. Uh, let's start with Nagi. 
This is the first architectural project they realized in 1994. Uh, it is one of the three permanent installation works at Nagi Museum of Contemporary Art in Okayama Prefecture. Um, Okayama Prefecture is that red point. Uh, maybe you can imagine how that, the location. Um, well, the building design is by the architect Arata Isozaki, and we are told that Isozaki invited Arakawa and Madeline for this project. Um, as you can see, Arakawa and Gin's space is a huge slanted tube, which you can enter to experience it. Uh, you'll see green ceiling and red floor, complementary colors, with two seesaws and iron buds, uh, one in a life scale, the other in 1.3 times bigger than that. Then you'll notice that uh, there is a replica of the famous Ryoanji Temple's rock garden. This is Ryoanji Temple's rock garden. I don't know, uh, maybe some of you have been there. Um, and uh, uh, it's the, 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 the uh, let's go back to Nagi. Uh, you see a replica of, of those, the rock garden placed bilaterally. And the title of this work is very long. Ubiquita site, Nagi's Ryoanji architecture body. The message question from Arakawa and Gins is, when you are in a space with objects, elements, that make you feel uneasy or insecure, um, together with the other elements that make you feel peaceful and secure, what would you feel first? If you get lost, just ask your body. In 1995, the following year of Nagi's Ryoanji, Arakawenigin's next architecture project came out. That is, Site of Reversible Destiny, Yoro Park, in Gifu Prefecture. The park is like a huge ball, and as you can see in this panoramic view, uh, there are no flat, horizontal, and vertical spaces. Everything is slanting, and you can easily lose your balance there. There are 10 architectural pavilions, they call pavilions, and nine of them are based on the main building called Critical Resemblance House. Um, after the site was open, it became very famous because unfortunately, many people got injured there. <laughs> uh, some people broke their legs and arms, and sometimes the ambulance were called. So, so um, Araka and Gins became uh, famous as dangerous artists in a short time. Um, I have been there so many times, and actually I got injured twice or three times. <laughs> uh, for the first time, I, I, I fell down and, and I cut my lips bleeding, and for the second time, I cut my forehead bleeding again. So it is a dangerous bug <laughs> for some people. Um, but uh, when media uh, interviewed Arakawa that, at that time, he said in a calm way, I don't know why people always try to walk on two legs. Look at children. They naturally start walking on all fours using their hands when they find un unstable areas. The space encourages their body to do so. It is our common sense that gets in the way of listening to the inner voice that comes from your body. Again, here's the message by Arakawa and Madeline. Try to believe in this wonderful thing that you have, your body, and use it as a scale measuring rod. Again, Madeline Narakawa here. Today, uh, the site is regarded as, regarded as uh, one of the must-go places in Japan. And last year, Yoro Park had 130,000 visitors. 
which is amazing because of the location, remote from any city which has good access to transportation. And we also see uh, so many Instagrammers uh, getting there. Look at these images <laughs> posted by them uh, on SNS, Twitter, or Facebook. I just love these images. Um, after the Yoro Park, Arakawangans became more and more enthusiastic about working with architecture. In 1997, there was exhibition, We Have Decided Not to Die, at Guggenheim Soho, exhibiting many architectural models. And in 1998, the following year, they pro their proposal entitled as Sensorium City, this is the image of Sensorium City, uh, Sensorium City was awarded by the Tokyo Metropolitan Government for the city planning competition for future development of the Tokyo Bay Area. But after all, it took 10 years to see a third built project, which is external gene house Shidami in Nagoya City in 2005. Uh, Nagoya is Arakawa's hometown. Shidami Housing Complex was a commissioned project by Nagoya City. As Arakawa and Madeline knew that they might have to compromise on many aspects during the process because it was a public project, they decided to start a completely private project at the same time that they were working on Shidami. Uh, that was the reversible Disney Lost Mitaka in memory of Helen Keller in Tokyo. The Mitaka Lofts consists of nine apartments and uh, five of them are for long-term lease and two of them are uh, for multi-purpose spaces including short-term stay and we, Arakawangin's Tokyo office, are using two uh, for our office and library. Since it was built, we, are, we have been using the loft for various purposes, such as architecture tours, a venue for events, researches, photo film shootings, and so on. Uh, let me show you some images. These are obviously from the photos taken at uh, architecture tours. I think one of them is uh, of the Columbia GSAP tour. Uh, these are some images for, uh, of our short stay program. Uh, uh, you can check our availability uh, either on our website or Airbnb. Um, and these are photos uh, from our cultural events, uh, we, which we organized. Um, you can see Arakawa giving a lecture at the loft. And these are images captured from the famous HBO drama, Girls. Um, since uh, it was aired, we started receiving more visitors from the States, thanks to Girls. <laughs> And these are uh, some photos uh, uh, taken at the lofts for a fashion magazine. Uh, this is uh, the brand Miu Miu uh, Prada. Okay. Um, as for the tours, uh, we receive students constantly from all over the world. And among all, there is a high school in Taiwan who sends us a group of students every year. We are told that their highlight of this, the, their study trip in Tokyo is uh, Tokyo Disneyland and Ghibli Museum. Do you know Ghibli, Studio Ghibli of Spirited Away? And the reversible Disney Lofts Mitaka. How do you like that? <laughs> and uh, Columbia University GSAP is also visiting us over the years. Uh, that is the latest tour uh, for GSAP study trip. It's uh, just two, two weeks ago or so. Maybe uh, you see some familiar faces. Yeah. 
and um, as the lofts are dedicated to Helen Keller, among our visitors, uh, we have hosted many people living with physical and mental disabilities, and professionals in rehabilitation, such as physiotherapists, therapists, care workers, and so on. Although the lofts have bumpy, undulating, slanting floor and sphere-shaped or cylindrical rooms, those people just can find their way of using the lofts, fitting their bodies easily. But why Helen Keller? Helen Keller was a perfect model for Araka and Mandolin whenever they studied on architectural projects. As you know, uh, Helen Keller lost her eyesight and hearing before she became two years old but with great continuous support of her family and friends and famous Miss Sullivan, Helen Keller succeed in seeing things, listening sounds, and even reading and speaking using a number of senses that, uh, which we still don't know their names. So Arakawa Gins thought that everybody should be Helen Keller, and everybody can be Helen Keller if we study carefully about our bodies. And for children, it goes without saying uh, that they just love the space. They, they become crazy, enjoying the lofts at the maximum. Uh, we, some, we sometimes feel sorry for them because uh, parents always say, it's time to go home, and they always say, no, I don't want to go home, I want to stay longer. Um, well, I can spend hours and hours talking about what an amazing space the lofts are, so uh, maybe I should stop here to go forward. And uh, for your reference, I wrote a copy of an article uh, as your handout today. And uh, this is an uh, 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 article written by Mr. Yoshihiko Sano, the president of Yasui Architects and Engineers, uh, uh, honorary member of uh, American, the American Institute of Architects, and a joint creator in Shidami and Amitaka project on design, architecture, and engineering. The article is originally, was originally issued uh, in Kenchiku Journal last December. Kenchiku Journal is one of the important architectural magazines in Japan. So I hope it helps you in understanding the history of the project better. Well, after the Mitaka Lofts um, long-awaited project, the Bioscleave House was completed in 2008 in East Hampton. This is Biosclave House. It was also a private project and started almost at the same time with Shidami and Mitaka. Um, let me show you one more slide of Biosclave House. It's, uh, it's from a study uh, tour with uh, some Japanese scholars, uh, university professors visiting the Biosclave House for further study on Arakawa Gin's uh, uh, body theory. Um, currently, the house is uh, under the management of the professor's group LL, LLC, LLC, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm, I always confuse with uh, other LL thing, <laughs> sorry. Um, I would like to mention one more built work which is biotopological scale juggling escalator that you can visit and see at Dover Street Market, New York. This work was commissioned by Comme des Garçons and was completed in 2013, just two weeks before uh, Madeline's passing. Madeline worked so hard on this project without Arakawa, but trying to listen to Arakawa all the time according to her. I think this was a wonderful step that gives us ideas on how to continue working on reversible destiny projects. Uh, Arakawa in 2010, as well as Madeline in 2014, met their 
biological deaths. Although we cannot work with our Akavangins uh, physically together anymore, if we can achieve in listening to their voices using our great abilities of our bodies, we can yet again collaborate together in creating more architectural projects, more architecture against death. Uh, I think I have a couple of minutes. Okay, one minute, okay. Um, let's, uh, let's go quickly with some unbuilt works, unbuilt projects. This is a Museum of Living Bodies. I simply love this uh, uh, concept. Uh, the concept is you know, the, the, the village or town or uh, community which you belong to should be regarded as museums in near future. And where are the artworks? Artworks are our bodies, our lives. Uh, this is uh, in detail. Um, I love this one too. Uh, Reversible Destiny Hotel. Um, it has a spiral of DNA. And uh, I would love to forward this project anywhere in the world. Uh, I imagine uh, you, you, you would like to stay at the Reversible Disney Hotel, right? Uh, this is twin tower of Reversible Disney Hotel. And then uh, it's more radical because on the ground level, you see uh, to sight of reversible destiny. So it's a challenging thing to, to get to the reception. You, you have to walk all the way <laughs> the, the site. Um, okay. So uh, this is amazing project, but uh, I will skip it. This is Kachidoki project, we called. Well, um, lastly, I would like to mention that every Arakawangin's works has its directions for use. Uh, for example, the first thing that the residents in Mitaka lofts have to do is to read the directions. Um, it is very witty list by Araka and Madeline, and the most important message comes at the end of the directions, which always says, to be continued. As you can imagine, Araka and Gin's architecture never can be completed without its users and their bodies. So let me close my presentation saying, reversible destiny projects are to be continued. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mawako and Mamoyo. I couldn't think of a better way to start the day than those two presentations. So I'd like to invo invite you both to join Julian Rose at the table for a short discussion. Um, thanks so much. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Um, thank you, Irene, for organizing. And thanks to both of you for your excellent presentations. That was kind of a perfect, um, I think, bracketing of the work that's in the gallery. And so I wanted to ask you um, a question for both of you to begin about how you understand the work in this exhibition kind of from two different perspectives. Um, for you, Mawako, kind of how you see it as continuing themes that maybe are brought up in the artwork. Um, and for you, Momoyo, how you see maybe the seeds of the later architectural practice, even though the work is quite speculative. And just to make it a, a bit more specific, I'm also curious to hear what both of you feel space meant to them. I think what's interesting to me, Irene has made, I think, a very compelling case that this is pivotal work. And in part, you see them really visualizing space very explicitly, I think, for the first time. And so maybe what it was about this kind of spatial practice that offered them something that wasn't available in the previous practice, or maybe this kind of abstract spatial exploration, how it became focused or transformed into the specific built projects, um, just to begin. OK. Um, <laughs> Uh, first of all, I think the exhibition looks really beautiful. Yeah. So congratulations Definitely. to Irene and all the team here at Columbia. 
Um, I really enjoy this show. Uh, firstly, because how the uh, design really integrates the, what's on, mm-hmm. uh, what's drawn on papers, and also um, what is built uh, a supporting system for those framed works. Um, as an art historian, I am really impressed by, first of all, beauty of those drawings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're really quite amazing. Um, and to me, it seems as though those uh, series of drawings are trying to somehow um, create a new system of uh, indicating different types of space, mm-hmm. um, like rather than using like a perspectival system. So right. it's almost like a creating new new language uh, that leads differently from what we normally uh-huh. use as language. So um, you can essentially read them um, as opposed to just seeing them. So there are diff- two different ways of engaging with those works, I think. I think that's super interesting. And just a quick follow-up, do you, do you feel like that's something that is rooted in the kind of diagrammatic aspects of Duchamp's influence? Because it's, yeah. it's, it feels very architectural um, in what it does, like a kind of notational system describing space, but it certainly doesn't really look architectural, so I'm wondering where else it might have come from. Yeah, so I would like immediately relate those compositions to, say, the large glass uh-huh. and how that composition itself not only uh, visually present what he Duchamp conceived as space, but also the mystery be- mm. behind it. So there is like a lot more than just a uh, uh, kind of uh, scientific way of analyzing the space, right. but there is a lot of kind of poetic aspect mm-hmm. to understanding of space, which yeah. I think really is the uniqueness of Arakawa, and particularly yeah. Yeah. when it comes to Arakawa and Madeline's works together. So yeah, then I guess the interesting question is how in their practice you feel that language continued or... Well, uh, first of all, I also uh, was impressed by those beautiful drawings, and uh, uh, I've never seen them uh, um, in a framed. Uh, framed look different, right? And uh, also, I I was surprised that many uh, lines and, mm-hmm. uh, are repeatedly, you know, yeah. writing uh, and very strong. Uh, Way, uh, handwriting, and uh, um, I'm, I became very curious uh, why Araka was so uh, enthusiastic in, in, in uh, writing so, in, how do you say, strong? Yeah, the, cro- the, the hatching yeah. pattern, the grids, mm-hmm. you're saying, yeah, yeah. Because uh, from the archival materials, uh, we also can see that it was a period that uh, they started focusing more and more on uh, percep- perception uh, and uh, you know uh, pe- how uh, people's body uh, would relate with the, the, the space. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, it's it's very curious to see that that the both at the same time. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, that that's a great point, and I, um, I'd love to actually hear from both of you more about this kind of paradox, maybe, of their relationship to the body, because um, I loved. Th- I mean, I was sorry to hear you injured yourself at the park, but it's it's interesting to have such a personal connection, right? And um, I I also appreciate the way you said it's kind of indescribable. I mean, I've been to the Bioclave House, and it is very difficult, I think, to relate um, linguistically or even representationally, maybe, to these kind of um, very intense physical experiences. But at the same time, I mean, Moako, for example, you showed the real rigor, analytical rigor of the relationship to language, the poetic relationship to language. There is so much kind of linguistic work that surrounds um, their practice and in, up to and including the reversible destiny which is a sort of entire philosophy you could say so I mean how how do you uh, both of you think about the way they combine those two elements in tension I mean are they are they kind of separate strains of the practice are they necessary to support each other I'm just kind of curious because they it does seem almost paradoxical and I think in a way you see that even in the drawings I agree this sort of the harshness uh, and the dominance of the grid, and then these small yeah. figures kind of right. being overwhelmed or, you know, mm-hmm. crushed, etc. So, mm-hmm. uh, 
I think in uh, Arakawa and Madeline's works, uh, there are always sense of humor and play. Mm -hmm. So those two dichotomy creates this intensity of like seriousness and playfulness. And when playfulness interject into this serious structure, there is some kind of explosion, uh, like you know, this kind of energy or force that opens up to the new, new like space or sphere or horizon. I don't know how to describe it, but I think um, like when you see those drawings in series, yeah. that kind of moment happens repeatedly, and it becomes kind of like a rhythm. You can sort of viscerally engage almost. Um, so I think that like physicality of their works mm. is already uh, always there. It's a continuing thread right. through both like seri yeah. <laughs> seriousness of their work and a few more in huh. the expression. Okay. So I think body like really is very important mm. in all of their works. <coughs> And Momoi, I'm curious, I mean, specifically in the built works, um, how they almost thought about designing places for the body. I mean, what, what was maybe the conversation like or what, I mean, I imagine it's not as simple as just sort of putting a scale figure in your drawing like most architects might do. I mean, it seems like they conceived of incredibly specific interactions between body and space. Um, and I, I'm just sort of curious how they might have gone about designing that or, or working through it. For example, in the BioCleave house, I know there are kind of poles at certain points because the floor is so unstable that you need additional support. I mean, I'm, that's just sort of not a, not a kind of experience that architects really ever spend any time designing or wouldn't know how to draw or, or model or, or simulate. So I'm, I'm sort of curious how um, that relationship to the body ent entered into their design process, if you can talk mm. about that. Um, it's 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 dif uh, very difficult to explain uh -huh. though, uh, but uh, I I remember that the Arakan and Madden always um, were working uh, with a team, hmm. you know, uh, and the team is varied in in their professions. Like um, uh, one is uh, uh, how can I say a physicist artist, huh. uh, singer, or athlete, okay. uh, it's, so, uh, and uh, uh, Arakawa and Gins loved to, uh, uh, loved to work with different hmm. uh, professionals, okay. and I think that's very interesting point. Uh, and uh, <laughs> other thing is uh, they always uh, were repeating that uh, they learn a lot from uh, children, hmm. uh, uh, like uh, under three years old, huh. mm -hmm. uh, before they start uh, speaking, uh, speaking language, oh, their uh, body perception is, is, is you know, uh, everything. Yeah. You know? They don't have, uh, before they get uh, language as their tool to communicate with, mm -hmm. the, the, all the perception, uh, are are to be used maximum. Huh, uh -huh. So uh, I think uh, uh, in that exhibition at the Guggenheim uh, Soho, uh, I remember that they had a, a panel of a, a, a baby uh, in rainbow color. Huh. <laughs> and I think that tells us the, the uh, the inspiring resource of Arakan Gin's architecture. That's interesting. So that's almost as a, like their version of a Vitruvian man or something. I mean, that's the kind of foundational mm. concept is this, mm. the, the, the perceptual model or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Well, I'm, I'm also mm. curious as far as um, interaction. Moako, you mentioned, I, I didn't know that. That's fascinating that the coffin pieces actually had lids. I, I had seen the pieces but didn't know that they were sort of interactive sculptures. Um, and of course with the Neodata group there's a connection to kind of early happenings and performance work. Um, 
I, and I'm, but I'm curious how you see that as evolving um, kind of all the way into architecture because I'm more familiar with the context, say, you know, Alan Capra in New York or the, a version of that that seemed sort of um, very stubbornly anti-architectural. I mean, if anything, that work, I think, in, in an American context kind of evolved into institu institutional critique and these sort of other legacies. So it's fascinating to me, not that this is in any way typical architecture that we end up with, um, but that, that at some point it becomes an impulse of wanting to create space or create yeah. building yeah. and structure. Yeah. I think that's a really great question because I think if you come from the architectural field, yeah. architecture is a container, right? Yeah. But I think from Arakawa against uh, approach, body is the um, huh. kind of yeah. instigator of uh, information, uh, generating information that then becomes a container. So it starts from the body rather yeah. than space. So body is the uh, core that creates space around it. Okay. So one uh, anecdote that I remember is that well, there are so many famous like bizarre anecdotes that's associated with Arakawa. When I think back in uh, I forgot two two thousands uh, some some time, uh, he was invited to speak at Tokyo University of Arts, and during that lecture, he was uh, talking to a uh, um, female student sitting next to him. And he uh, questioned, uh, so what do you think like two people would do? Would they just get married? And, but he said, like, that's just boring. If you, if you put two people together in the same space, something's going to happen. You don't even have to try anything. But try to think of you are going to marry this area. <laughs> That's and amazing. I will come to you and ask, what, this area? And you should say, oh, no, 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 this area. So he's not starting to um, identify a person with, huh. with the loca location, or with mm. a person, figure. He's talking about huh. a space that will be generated by somebody's presence. Huh. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it's really bizarre thing to say, but yeah. it is in line with what he's been doing in his painting and also sculpture. And when it comes to the infant, yeah. um, I didn't, I skipped one slide, which uh, um, is from 1986, and it's entitled The Figure of an Infant. And it shows blank, almost blank white canvas with this kind of uh, irregular line, uh, sometimes broken, sometimes mm -hmm. connected. And um, in my view, that is how infant starts to sense the world, mm -hmm. okay. but that sense and perception is not yet quite coagulated. Okay. Um, so infant is the creature uh, who doesn't yet live within the constructed, huh. constru constructed actions or perceptions, and I'm quoting again Lyotard. Right. Okay. So um, it's this kind of um, coming into being, that that active moment, um, which is uh, the key to sort of deciphering Arakawa's yeah, exactly. painting as well as yeah. architecture. Yeah. Okay. Um, as, as they were uh, always saying that there are a number of senses that we, we still don't know their names. And uh, we usually uh, uh, tend to say five senses or six senses. But uh, according to Arakawa and Madeline, there are hundreds or even huh. thousands. And uh, uh, they, would, they want to figure them out, uh, uh, making more uh, spaces uh, to fill uh, that, those senses, and uh, as Miwako mentioned, that uh, Mitaka lofts is, uh, or other built works of Baraka and Madeline, ex especially housing, uh, are just ex uh, we can think of them just as a extension mm. of our body. So uh, if we see our our bodies, there are no vertical, horizontal lines, right. so we don't need them. Right. Um, but of course, uh, uh, for 
modern living, we need to put sofa or bed <laughs> or table. So yes, they, they, there are um, square, right, square right. rooms. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think when you enter or Yoro Park or also Mitaka Loft and Bioscreve House, everything is so counterintuitive. Right. Like you, like you're so so conditioned to expect some pillar here or some, you know, um, element of uh, furniture there, but nothing of that expected element is in their design. So, uh, uh, well, that's my personal experience yeah, yeah. Uh, going there. Well, I, I agree. I mean, and then that becomes, I mean, even just the lack of a flat floor becomes sort of uh, incredibly startling and I think it ha forces you, okay, um, who are winding down, but, you know, forces you to become more aware of, of stepping in your body. But mm. I'm also curious um, how you th how you feel, you know, it's, it's not just one body in a lot of these spaces, it's sort of bodies. And you mentioned even that their original kind of interest in architecture was in part because of its connection to social um, social aspects and so I'm wondering I know many of those projects weren't realized but sort of how this emphasis on one body and this kind of you know say awakening of the body or, or extrasensory perception how does that add up into a kind of um, social organization you know what kind of communities were they envisioning and things like the, the Museum of Living Bodies which seems totally fascinating it's like taking some of these ideas but it's a scale yeah, you know, almost yeah. a, an urban scale at that point. Well, um, until uh, some years ago, uh, when whenever we show these images, of yeah. Museum of Living Bodies or Reversible Disney Hotel, they just, uh, people just laugh about huh. that. Oh, architecture against the death, nonsense. <laughs> right. how, how, how you can defy, the, defy death? Yeah. But uh, I would like to mention one uh, thing that I'm, I'm very interested in. Um, after the, the earthquake, and tsunami in Fukushima, uh, I feel that the people's reaction had changed. Oh, interesting. Um, yes, uh, for example, there was an architecture student who joined our architecture tour one day. And after the tour, he said to me, I really would like to, to build this reversible Disney hotel in Fukushima, huh. because I'm, I'm from Fukushima. And I asked him why, and he said, well, as, as you may know, Fukushima is kind of abandoned uh, yeah. area, yeah. untouchable, uh, because of what happened to the power, nuclear yeah. power yeah. plants. Um, but he said, if we can build this reversible Disney hotel, uh, I can imagine there will be many people coming and see the hotel and staying from mm -hmm. all over the world. And uh, it's really the, uh, the project uh, of reversing Fukushima's destiny. Huh. And I, I, I said to myself, wow, this is something, you know, we, we never uh, had that kind of reaction, especially from young people. Huh. So I think uh, uh, people are now um, uh, um, regarding uh, uh, the concept by Arakangins uh, more seriously, uh, uh. and uh, I, I, I still, I'm insisting some uh, uh, cities. Uh, uh, to take this project. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I like that. Idea. I think um, that's kind of, it's a nice note to end on that, um, yeah, we're entering a new historical phase maybe in the life of their work and that there, mm -hmm. there is going to be a new reaction. So, well, thank you guys both very much. And yeah. thanks thank everyone. you very much.